going to show you how to make some Viking inspired jewelry. Specifically, an amulet ring like this and a finger ring that can also be used to make a more decorative amulet ring like that. Both are find, found in grave finds uh, throughout the period um, and both techniques serve very well. Uh, the spiral technique of this ring was actually uh, found on a number of uh, arm rings as well. Uh, the ends just are, are tied together with the, with the spiral. And I actually saw a ring very similar to this uh, on the website of a museum that's based in Indonesia. So it's a fairly cross-cultural technique. So I will show you the tools and let's get started. So the materials for this are is very simple. Just a length of copper wire or silver wire or whatever metal you want to use. Um, the softer the better. Uh, you just need a length big enough to do the, the appropriate number of wraps you want. And uh, you know anything between 16 gauge up to 8 gauge will work. Uh, 8 gauge is really hard to use and you have to taper the ends before you can do this or this. Uh, but it's still fairly nice. Uh, anything bigger than that is too hard to use. Anything smaller than that will just crumple so there's no point. So 16 gauge to 8 gauge. Uh, this is 14 gauge. It's the ground wire from Romax. It's a pretty easily available uh, electrical wire, wire that's fairly soft. Now, the tools you need. First and foremost, you need something to cut your wire. The reason that I'm using aviation snips is because they actually do almost a flush cut compared to side cutters. Um, so when you snip this, it remains somewhat flat. And, and doesn't have a lot of burr on it or anything like that. Whereas side cutters, they, they pinch the metal. So you wind up with a point like you know that on the end of your, your wire that's razor sharp and that kind of really sucks when it hits your hand and you get cut. Uh, so if you do that, you'll need to file the end before you start working on it, which is pretty easy. With a file like this, it's a, just a diamond grit. Uh, I don't know where this one came from. It sort of just ended up with my tools, but it works pretty well. Uh, and it's basically just rubbing the end down until it's smooth enough to, to be able to handle safely. You don't really need to do it as much with this one as you would with, uh, with side cutters because these don't pinch. So a file is also a good idea. Um, you need a, pair, a couple pairs of pliers. Uh, these ones here are just square end pliers. Um, available from a, a craft store. Uh, pretty much any craft store will carry them. Try to get ones that have no teeth so they don't mar the, the metal. And as well, it's good to spend a little bit of extra money to get a good pair because the edges on a good pair are uh, more rounded than they are on these. Uh, which you may have to buy separately um, instead of in a big kit. Uh, they also make ones with nylon jaws, which might be good if you're working with something like silver that you don't want to mar up because it's so much softer. Um, the copper's not quite as soft, so it's not as much of an issue. Uh, these ones are actually cheap needle nose pliers that had no teeth in them that I cut down and then rounded the ends on to do uh, chain mail, so I get the most amount of pressure on it as I can. Um, I actually quite like these because it gives you control over the shape of the plier you make and you can actually round the edges yourself. Same with these, you can round the edges. Um, but this just gives you a little extra control. Uh, the next thing you'll need is some form of a hammer. This is just a fairly small uh, ball peen. It's, it's pretty good and uh, you do want the face to be fairly polished and fairly rounded so you don't mar your work. Uh, this one is about due to go and get polished. Uh, the last thing you need is a uh, ring mandrel. It has all the gradations on it of, of the different sizes of ring. So this way you know that the ring that you're making will actually fit on your hand. And there's two ways that you can go about uh, testing that. If you don't know your ring size, uh, you can either take a ring that fits you very well and just slide it up on the mandrel. And knowing that the center of your ring sits, in this case, on 
uh, 10 and 3 quarters. Um, or you can go and buy a ring sizing kit, which has a bunch of rings in it. Um, the one I have, which I can't find at the moment, uh, is basically a set of rings that are on a, on a steel ring. So they slide around almost like a keychain. Um, and you basically slide each ring onto your finger to see if it fits and check to make sure it's secure and everything. Um, those are very handy if you're making things for other people. Uh, this ring mandrel, you can get it pretty much any any craft supply store like uh, Michael's or anything like that. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. I recommend getting a metal one so you can actually hammer on it instead of having to hammer on some other form of a, uh, a mandrel or collet or anything like that. This just means that you can hammer on it. Um, if you can get one that's steel, it's better. Um, aluminum tends to get a little bit beat up, as you can see, because it does take quite a lot of hammer. So, uh, to get started, the easiest way to do this is to, to pull out roughly the amount that you think you'll need. Um, I'm going to probably go with this. Uh, I'll show you how to do this ring first. So I want it to fit on my finger. So I find the appropriate spot on the ring mantle. And I find if I go a little bit lower than that, so if it's 10 and 3 quarters, I'll probably go to 10 and a quarter. And I start by just bending the wire around the number of revolutions I want. And in this case, I like to do uh, three all the way around and then cross. So what you have is this, and it's actually sprung out a little bit to basically the right size. You kind of push it past it and let it sit back on the same spot. So now you have your your basic shape of the ring. Then you take these two ends and you basically just uh, twist them so that they cross each other. Just like that. And that is the beginning of the spiral. So now you can work with uh, one side of it at a time. Bending it and pushing it down against the mandrel and bending it around the other half and pulling it tight. So you wind up with this kind of thing, one at a time, pushing them around and bending them in. And then if you find that it starts to lift a little bit, you can take your hammer and just hammer it in a little bit. And putting your thumb over top does sort of help keep things in order. So when you get the length of spiral you want, the size of spiral you want, you just stop with the ends this direction and slide it off the mandrel. So you have that. Uh, I generally go with, uh, to trim the edges, I generally go with about one length of my finger, one width of my finger, um, only because that's a measurement that I know. Um, it's easy, I don't have to measure things. I guess that's about five eighths of an inch. Um, not too big, not too small. Um, but it's, yeah, the fingertips just an easy measure. Um, so you cut both sides. Now comes an inter a uh, kind of interesting part. You have to wrap these under. One thing you can do is if you don't trust the strength of your fingers, you can hold right on this with the pair of pliers. Um, just like that. And that holds it. Uh, I've been doing this for a while now, so I kind of trust my finger strength enough to not uh, let it slip or break or anything. So now when you get to this point, it might be kind of hard on your fingertip to actually bend that. So now you can, if you're not using your pliers already, you can use your pliers. And it's basically just angling it and pushing on the end to get it to wrap down and lie flat, just like that. So now you can do it on the opposite side, 
And it doesn't matter if the, the layers lift up a little bit uh, when you're hammering it in the next step, they'll flatten back down. Sounds same process again, just using the mechanical advantage you get with the pliers to push it down and let it lay flat. So now you slide it back onto the mandrel and because of how these are, um, it won't slide all the way up to the same spot. Um, it's a little bit tight uh, just because of the of the, the new metal that's in there. It's not going to be able to slide up, but that's okay. Uh, the next step is going to uh, gonna solve that. Now, if you want to do it like these, it will cause a little more hammering and stuff. Um, this kind of twist, I don't think was actually used in period. There aren't any archaeological examples. And the only examples that exist of rings, of finger rings like this, uh, only have one or two wraps of metal, uh, mostly because the metal was very expensive, especially wire, just because of the process of having to pull the wire through a draw plate over and over and over and continually annealing it uh, made it a very, very costly commodity. So they, they would try and conserve as much wire as possible. Uh, if you wanted to put a twist in it for a decorative thing, it's not, and if it's not for reenactment, uh, you basically just take a pair of pliers put it on it, twist the ring, the number of twists you want, and then to get it to uh, to line up properly, you can actually twist the individual rings over and sort of braid them. Um, and then it, as you're hammering, it all flattens out. Uh, I'm not going to do it to this one, uh, mostly for time's sake. So now what you want to do is hammer on all of these surfaces uh, as much as possible while applying uh, forward pressure or backward pressure to, to draw it up onto the mandrel. Um, this is going. To, this is a very noisy process, so I won't do it on camera, just to save your ears. Um, I will cut to the final steps when I'm finished. And it's basically just hammer, 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 pull, hammer, 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 pull. Uh, and if you really need to stretch the metal, you can use the ball peen side, uh, which will cause the metal to, to stretch in the directions and then flat it back out with the face of the hammer. So I will finish this part and then I'll be back in a moment. So now that I have it at the appropriate size, uh, it might actually be perfectly all right to leave it this way. Uh, but there are a few little burrs here and there on the ends of things. And so it's good to just take the file just very carefully start to file off the burrs. Now one thing to note on the use of files, on a regular file that has teeth, you never want to draw back with pressure uh, because you'll actually bend the teeth over and then your file won't cut as smoothly. Uh, with one of these, it's not important because the file cuts in both directions because it's just a, a grit of diamond. Um, So it's it's, uh, it's a pretty good little tool uh, to have. And it leaves a fairly high polish. It's not like a file that'll leave a, fair, a rough polish or a rough finish on it. This just leaves a nice smooth, smooth finish. Um, now, if, if comfort is an issue, if there are little burrs and stuff on the inside, which sometimes happens, you can take a piece of emery cloth of a fairly high grit and just run it along the inside. Uh, sometimes I can get them with this a little bit. Just rolling it around. Because it's usually right up in here where these two little little joins are. Excuse me, it causes a, uh, a little pinch spot which can be uncomfortable. And so now you have a ring. Um, it generally only takes about, you know, once you get used to it, it takes about 10 minutes, which really isn't that much of a uh, time investment. And uh, you can do it with any number of spirals. Uh, the most I've seen 
in period finds is about this. Uh, usually they're smaller. They're usually just a twist or two. Um, so, but it's a, it's a very quick way to make a fairly attractive ring uh, from scrap material. Now, for these amulet rings, um, what I like to do is find an, an even spot on the mandrel. With these, it doesn't have to be formed on a mandrel because uh, you can use any round object to, to form around a stick or something. Or you could attempt to do it by hand and then smooth it out later with a... Uh, um, with a, a mandrel and, and a hammer, or a, a big iron and a hand, handle, or a piece of doweling and a hammer or something. So it's it's not uh, too complicated of a, of a process. Um, so basically, what you want to do is find the size you want, and like the other one, you wrap it around slightly below where you want the size. And this one too, you can do any number of wraps you you please. Um, you know, I find this is, is a decent size. It's not too big. Uh, this was a, bit, a little bit large for the size of the pendant. Um, I would go smaller if I uh, remade the ring for it. Uh, so basically, again, it's just this, and then I cut it off uh, at my finger. And then you slide it through the object that you want to turn into a, a uh, pendant. Um, in this case, I'll... I'll do it on the ring and then I'll cut it off after. Uh, I'm not worried about wasting the copper because I generally save the scraps and melt them down to uh, do castings with. So, uh, so then what you do is you take a pair of pliers and you grip it in the middle uh, as wide as you want it and you bend them across from each other creating this, this square box shape um, and then you take your plier you just grip it again with your pliers and you take one of your sides and you bend it under basically the same process of finishing the spiral then it gets to a point where you can't really use your uh, your fingers anymore then you swap to the second side and you do the same process. Bending it around so you can't use your fingers anymore. Then you just take your pliers and using the mechanical advantage, you can sort of, with a sort of a twisting motion, um, bending these up and around. Uh, sometimes longer pliers help with this process because you can grip it, grip it better. And the good thing about the mechanical advantage on these is if you squeeze at the same time as rotating the piece, you can get that end quite flush. Even if it's not the the softest material, you can force it to your force it to your will. Um, and again it's good to file this after so that it doesn't become scratchy or anything because these generally end up being worn against the chest um, or if you're doing it on some kind of sword fitting or, or something um, like a sheath fitting or whatever um, they can rub and catch on clothing if you're not careful so now that they're secure, uh, I would file the edges off, and there you have a little pendant ring. Um, sometimes this ends up with a cool twist in it, similar to this one. Uh, if you wanted to, you could hammer it and flat it. Um, another thing that I liked doing was I took my section of wire, let's say this is quite a bit longer, and I flatted the center of it before um, twisting it into, or turn, uh, bending it into the ring. I flatted the section, uh, pretty much the, the distance from the two uh, the two wraps. Uh, then I twisted it with just two pairs of pliers, uh, one on each end of the, the metal, uh, just something like this, and then twisted. And 
it uh, created a very interesting ring that is totally different than anything else I'd ever seen. So the, this technique, though it's very simple, very quick, is a very effective way of, um, of mounting things. And then you would just take the two ends of your, your cordage or uh, chain or something and attach the ends below the, uh, below the twists which hold them in place as well as it, uh, it helps hold the pendant a little more securely. So that's that for this tutorial. Uh, it can't really be any more simple. Um, you can create all kinds of wonderful things with, uh, with this kind of wire technique. Um, and it just adds a bit of something to the piece that you're, you're hanging. Uh, you know, because if, if I took this, this little spear and I hung it from just a piece of cordage, it wouldn't look nearly as um, complete, not nearly as ancient as it does with the ring on it. Um, the, and the ring just holds it very, very securely so that now the, the weakest point is not the connection of the, the pendant to the, uh, to the cord like it would be if you just used a, spl uh, a split ring or uh, some kind of clasp or you used a jump ring or something. This is a very, very secure hold. So if you have a very secure cord, like uh, let's say you have a leather cord and you knot it to this, well, those knots are now just the weakest point, just in case you, just your knots might come undone. Uh, but let's say you're very good at tying knots. This makes sure there's no real weak point in your uh, thing, just like if you attach chain mail to this in a, in a modern sense. Um, like a chain mail chain to it. Now this is not uh, going anywhere. The chain that I wear normally with the, the Viking knit, um, I kind of wish I had have done this kind of a ring on it because the ring here actually has a split that hides inside the, uh, the wrap there. And uh, I'm always worried that this ring is going to come undone and I'll lose the, the copper Mjolnir pendant that I made. Uh, whereas this, you'll never worry about it. So, uh, that's it for this tutorial. Uh, thanks for watching. Again, um, thank you for liking, commenting, and subscribing. It means a lot. Uh, and please don't hesitate to ask any questions if you have them. Thank you.